Today, we're making fish dogs. Ever since I first shot one of these fish, I've been blown away by the fat content. And I've always wondered if it'd be possible to make a fish sausage that could rival the dogs of my childhood dreams. Stick around to the end to find out how we went and see how you can have a crack at this for yourself at home. And here's the fish, officially known as a spotted sawtail. We call them gold spot though. Sawtail are known to inhabit almost the entirety of the Australian East Coast, from northern Queensland all the way down to southern New South Wales. Some people believe that they are no good to eat, but I challenge them to give it a try and maybe this video can change their mind. With proper handling and prep, these fish are unreal to eat. I encourage you to check out my two-part series, Dry Age Fish at Home, if you're looking for the best ways to handle your fish. Sawtail are a great indicator fish, forming massive schools on pressure points in current just like this. Often they're accompanied by much more sought after species such as snapper and mackerel, and perhaps in the presence of such an abundance of these other species, people have formed opinions of this humble fish. Either way, I get super excited when I see these fish for a number of reasons. Primarily for me, it's knowing that I'm gonna be taking home some firm fleshed fatty fillets. They're not a particularly hard fish to shoot, however, they can be skittish, especially when they aren't in big schools like this. You can see those beautiful spots on these fish here as I bring this one up. Electric blue fins and gold spots all over them. It's worth mentioning now why they also call these guys surgeon fish. On their tail are a number of small bony scutes, basically blades, and these will cut you if you're not careful. This slice on my finger came from just reaching inside the esky. I know of a few people who just cut them off before icing their fish. As always, I'm going to bleed my fish as quickly as possible in order to ensure the best eating quality. A quick cut behind the gills in one of the major arteries, just in front of the heart, will quickly pump out any of the blood left in the fish. Again, another nice example of a gold spot. This time, however, it wasn't schooling with a bunch of other fish, just one or two others, and it didn't let me get anywhere near as close. As I pull this fish in, you can see just how thick they are. Ugh. She's got bonta. And as these fish get bigger, you can get some seriously chunky fillets off them, marbled the whole way through with fat. Perhaps more common is the Australian sawtail. We do find them in good numbers as well, and usually these guys and the gold spots will be mixed together. Lacking these spots, their bodies are a plain grayish to blue color. And personally, I prefer to eat the gold spots though. I find the meat is usually fattier and cleaner for whatever reason. And if you're following along at home, you could use any nice white fleshed fish that you might have available to you. Fattier fish are always gonna give you juicier dogs though. Mm. To break this fish down, I'm gonna be using my favorite filleting knife ever. This is the Victorinox six inch curved boning knife. If you've watched any of my other videos, you'll know I love this knife for its short, stiff and curved blade, giving you maximum control over the whole cutting surface. If you're interested in this knife, I'll have a link in the description below for it. And as always as well, I recommend your knife is as sharp as possible before beginning any butchery or breakdown. It will always give you a cleaner and better finished product. Sharpening stones are quite cheap and easy to use these days, and I always recommend picking one up. I'll include a link for a stone that I use down below as well. Now this fish has been hanging in the fridge for a few days now and you can see it's dried out slightly. In future, I would probably process them a little fresher than this. There's no issues with the meat, but you'll see why in a sec here. Starting out, I'm gonna take the head and the wings off. And I like to do this just to remove any unnecessary bulk from the fish to make further butchering easier. You can see here just how much fat is marbled through that belly flap of this fish. Then as well, inside the belly cavity, that giant lump of visceral fat that we'll be using. All fat pearled and plump. There's also a ton of fat around the organs and I attempted to recover this as well, but to be honest, the smell was pretty off-putting and finding some that was clean and then separating that from the organs as well proved to be really difficult. Removing the fillet as I would with any other fish, making an incision near the dorsal spines and running the tip of my knife along the spine. Sawtail have very tough and rough skin that can dull your knife extremely quickly. To aid in opening up the skin, I always angle my knife backwards so I'm cutting from the inside out, running my knife down to the tail until I've fully opened the top of the fillet. From there, I'll work my knife down along the spine bones, separating the meat from the skeleton. On the knife there, there's a little teaser for all that fat that's inside that fish. 
Continue separating the meat from the spine until all you are left with is the ribs still connected. Then, running the knife along the spine, hold onto the tail and push the knife through those ribs. Flip the fillet over and just admire all of that fat in there. Fuck me. Now it was a pretty hot day, and to be honest, a lot of this fat was already beginning to render down, so I put the other side of the fish back in the fridge while we process this first one. First up is skinning this fat slab, and here's where I stitch myself up slightly with the hanging and drying. In the past, as the skin is so rough on these guys, I've had a fair bit of success just peeling it straight off, but now that the fish has dried out, the skin just was way more stuck to the fish. Running a knife under the meat worked for some of the skin, but it ended up tearing through the rest. So I ended up using a combination of skinning as you would a mammal kind of, by peeling the skin back and separating it with a knife. And then also just your standard running the knife under the meat. Eventually we had the fillet skinless and you can see all that fat in the back of the fillet there. Unfortunately, a lot of this is mixed into the bloodline and we'll be removing that later on, but there's still a ton of that fat that works through into the muscles. I cannot believe the fat that is marbled through this piece of belly meat. Really sort of voluptuously tender. Now we've got our beautiful skinless fillet here, you can see that enormous chunk of fat in the belly area. We'll be cleaning that up and utilizing all of that in just a second. Firstly though, let's remove the top loin by cutting along those pin bones. Completely separate that, and once again, I can't help but admire all of that fat and marble through this meat. And this might rustle a few feathers here, but this seriously looks like a wagyu of the sea to me. Look at that cross section. Not even a huge bloodline and you can see fat tracking all through the eye just there. So let's put that aside and work on the belly meat. Quickly wipe away any mess with paper towel. As always, I'm using zero fresh water here while prepping. And that is an absolutely ridiculous lump of fat on that belly there. Let's get the tail portion cut off and again, fat marbled all through this meat. I'm going to remove the pin bones from the back side of the fillet here, breaking through the inside where they meet the ribs. Then, let's slice the ribs out, sliding our knife under the bones and using them as a guide to retain as much meat as possible. After that, we're left with a beautiful flap of belly meat, which we can clean up further later on. And now the inside flap of belly meat from those ribs. Let's clean up this chunk of fat. There's a sort of lining on it when it's exposed in the body cavity, and I'm gonna clean it all off as much as possible. Using a combination of a spoon and a knife, you can sort of peel it off. Once that's all cleaned up, let's run our knife along the inside of the ribs and cut it off. This beautiful lump of fat can now go into a separate bowl with any other fat that gets trimmed off. We can also cut out the meat in between the ribs and add that to our pile. One of the amazing things about these dogs is we can use whatever scraps we can get off of these fish. And speaking of, once we take the other fillet off the frame, I'm going to scrape the bones and any of this meat can also go into our pile. We'll repeat the breakdown process for the other fillet and then chuck it all back in the fridge before any of the fat gets a chance to start rendering out. After all that, we ended up with this massive bowl of fat from just two fish. I have not seen this come out of any other fish at all. Now the stereotypical red hot dogs I had as a kid, these ones that your parents always told you were made from the ears and assholes, well at least my parents did, are often referred to as Franks or Frankfurts here in Australia. I'm not entirely sure how far, if at all close they are to traditional Frankfurters. They're seen as the cheap, shitty, processed meat sausage that maybe you'll get the pleasure of experiencing one day at a party when your parents aren't around, or maybe that was just me. Either way, for our fish hot dogs, I wanted to try to recreate the joy of biting into one of these dogs. The satisfying snap. Exploding in your mouth. Absolutely delicious. The addictive seasoning and the smooth texture of the finely ground emulsified meat inside. Hunting around online, we have a couple examples of fish sausages that people have made before, but nothing quite like the dogs we're attempting to make. 
I'll include some links to these recipes down below as well. A lot of these existing recipes have a long list of different herbs and spices with examples including traditional Hungarian, Italian and Japanese sausages. Kamaboko is more of a Japanese fish cake than a sausage, but it's made from surumi, which is a blended fish paste used to make fish cakes and imitation crab meat actually. While it's not perfect, it's actually quite close texturally to what we would like to make, so we're going to bookmark that. Josh Nyland also has a recipe for seafood hot dogs, and he has achieved exactly the kind of look I'm after. I gotta say though, using two kilograms of scallop meat, another kilogram of prawn meat, and a bunch of fish and fish fat isn't really in my budget nor achievable for us mere mortals. I feel his recipe relies largely on these premium ingredients for the flavor. So it's somewhat lacking on seasoning for my liking, but we'll bookmark this as well to take some notes. I'm not too sure where to start with seasonings and quantities either. So I've also found this recipe for some simple beef hot dogs, which we can take some more info from. Both Surumi and Josh Nyland's recipe utilize egg whites, and this is something I've added to fish in the past, and you can check that out in my fish cakes video that I made as well. I feel like it gives the meat this kind of springy, fluffy consistency once it's all blended, which will work perfect for what we want, so let's definitely utilize that. Totaled up, Josh Nyland's recipe comes to about 3.8 kilos of meat or protein. At four egg whites, this is about one per kilogram of protein. And Surumi uses one egg white per 400 grams. Depending on how many batches we do, we may just round our egg whites to a hole to save having to split them up. Josh Nyland's seafood dogs also use 500 grams of fish fat, which equates to about 13% fat to protein ratio. We don't have much control over this for our dogs, unfortunately, so whatever we end up with after rendering our fat is what we've got. His recipe also calls for the use of red collagen casings, and these are going to give our dogs that iconic red skin that we're after. The simple beef dogs don't have any additional fat added. However, I have seen plenty of other sausage recipes calling for as much as 30 to even 40% fat to protein. Again, we don't have much control over this for our dogs, so it is what it is. The seasoning, however, I will take a little from. And this recipe calls for a bunch of different stuff, but I'm going to keep it simple, at least for these first ones, so we can try it all out. For seasoning, we're going to be using salt, garlic powder, and onion powder. And going off this recipe, the ratios to protein are 2% salt, 0.5% garlic powder, and 0.5% onion powder. And now that we've got all those numbers worked out, let's figure out how much meat and fat we've actually got. Let's get all of our portioned meat out of the fridge and start our final processing. I've been keeping it in the fridge on racks to ensure the meat has plenty of airflow around it and it hasn't been sitting in its own juices in a bowl or dish. I'm going to remove as much of the bloodline as possible from our meat. I want to achieve the cleanest flavor I can using only the white meat. I'm also going to cube up the meat before throwing it into the container to get a final weight. In the end, we had about 1.2 kilos of sawtail meat, or about two and a half pounds. 1.242 kilos. From there, this entire container went into the freezer. Chilling all this meat down now is going to help us ensure we get a smooth and creamy emulsification later on. And now for the fat. Everything that went into that bowl goes into the saucepan, and just like you would if you were to render beef tallow or any other kind of fat, we want to put it over a medium heat and gently simmer everything until the fat starts to liquefy. Initially, the smell of this fat can be a little funky, but I found as it starts to cook, it actually just smells like fish and chips or fried fish. Not too bad at all. After about 10 to 15 minutes, all the fats are liquefied and all we're left with is the sinew and meat to strain off. We ended up with about 55 grams of fish fat here, and that works out to be about 4% ratio to protein. There's still plenty of fat through that meat, but it is quite low, so we'll just have to see how we go. And now for our spices. And for the sake of my own testing and recipe development, it's nice to have some small scales like these that can give us exact numbers. At a 0.5 ratio to meat, we ended up with about 6.2 grams of both garlic and onion powder. Now we're going to be doing two batches, so we're making two portions of 3 grams of garlic and onion powder, followed by salt at a ratio of 2% to our meat, which comes out at about 24.8 grams, or 12 grams of salt per batch. As we're doing two batches, I'm going to use one egg white per batch, which is going to total us at about two eggs per kilo.
taking our meat out of the freezer, I'm gonna chuck half of it into the blender. Reflecting back on this, I probably could have cubed the meat up a bit smaller, put it through a mincer, or even done a few more batches. I thought it would be sweet, but it actually rallied my blender pretty hard, and now I've got fish meat all through the motor. Throw in the seasoning, half of the fat that's been chilling in the fridge, and one egg white. We want to work quickly. Now the aim is to blend all of this while it stays cold to ensure the fat fully emulsifies into the meat. We want to achieve a smooth consistency with everything evenly blended. If the mix warms up too much, the fat will begin to liquefy. Some people like to add ice cubes in this process, but I didn't want to introduce any extra fluids. Blending all of that now, you can see the meat and fat beginning to combine. Checking with a the thermometer, we're sitting at around 6 degrees Celsius, so we're still good there. The meat was all starting to stick together, however, and not blend properly here, so using a silicon spatula, I pressed it down just above the blades. This helped it to not ball up and fly around the blender, meaning it could all be fully combined. I noticed watching a few videos that big commercial blenders usually have what looks almost like a big metal spatula that does a very similar job. With the meat fully combined, the temperature has already come up to about 16 degrees Celsius. As the things blend, they will start to heat up, hence why some people like to use ice. Scoop all of that out and you can see that fish paste right there. What you can also see is that same paste all through the motor of my blender. Oh, it's delicious. I'm gonna quickly bash out the next batch and then let's get to stuffing. The red collagen casings we're using here are super easy to use. No soaking, no washing, no nothing like that. This was my first time making sausages and to be honest, it was way easier than I was expecting. Just take the casing and start loading it onto the sausage stuffing tube and load on as much as you can, bunching it all up down the barrel. I'm using a KitchenAid mincer sausage stuffer attachment here and I'll put a link down below for one of these. Most standalone mincers will also come with sausage stuffer attachments. Just check the nozzles are gonna fit your casings. Casings I'm using here are 23 millimeters and they're quite narrow. Tie a knot in the end of your casing and load some of the meat mix into the feed tray on top. Pinching the end of the casing, I'm gonna press the mixture down into the stuffer and allow it to push the casings off the end of the barrel. So they become really plump. Now I probably just overstuff these or maybe collagen casings don't like it, but trying to twist these dogs into links ended up with me popping the whole thing. So back to the drawing board we went. After stuffing the next length here, this time I opted to just tie string at each interval I wanted. Repeat this whole process for the rest of your mix until you've got a stack of dogs like this. To cook these dogs, I'm gonna put them into a pot of cold water and slowly bring it up to about 65 degrees Celsius or 150 Fahrenheit. This little oil thermometer that I like to use is really helpful in monitoring that temperature and I'll add a link down below for one of these as well. Once we're at temperature, I'll turn off the heat and then we'll let our dog sit for about five minutes. Strain the water off and then chuck them onto a tray. Cover with some damp cloths to make sure they don't dry out and then put them in the fridge until you're ready to use them. To serve our dogs, bring a pot of water up to the boil and then turn off the heat. Drop the dogs into the water and put the lid on. We'll let them sit for around 10 minutes here. And while we wait for those, I'm gonna prep the buns. Now I slice the sides off of these so we can get a nice little aesthetic toast on them. And the caramelization of the brioche buns is also super tasty. It's always good to prepare a little more than you might need, just in case of any mishaps. And you can see here, one of the dogs popped. And this happens from time to time, possibly from overstuffing or maybe just a weak spot in the casing. That's all good though, because we've got plenty. I'm gonna take the best ones here and separate them with a sharp knife. 
we'll put them into our beautiful toasted buns and on top of a couple we'll add some sauerkraut. The others will just get mustard and aesthetically I really like these plain mustard ones but to eat I really love the sauerkraut with a little mustard and tomato sauce as well. And there we go, that is how I made fish hot dogs. We've got a couple options here. We did make one with the sauerkraut as well and some tomato sauce. Personally, I do love a bit of sauerkraut on my dog. So I thought I'd mix it up, see how we go with that. It was my first time making sausages, so definitely a bit of trial and error. So the snap test, the most important part. Ooh, a beautiful little snap there. And the taste. Mmm. Taste-wise. Super happy with that. Flavors are good. Nice little garlicky, oniony hint in there. Not too salty as well. If I had to say anything, I would say that it's a little bit dry. Our fat percentage was quite low. It ended up being about 4% fat to meat ratio. A lot of other recipes call for anywhere between like 13 to 30% fat to meat ratio. It's not overly dry though. Um, it's not inedible, but definitely would like to see like a little more juice in there, but I'm not complaining, honestly. I would, 10 out of 10, would dog again. Mm. Actually really good. I'm super impressed. I did not think it was going to work this well. Alright, let's try these ones in the buns. Just your standard, your classic, bit of mustard, bit of bread, can't go wrong with that. Mmm. Bit of sauce on that. Big difference. Even more premium. Mmm. That's pretty good. Pretty happy with myself. If I do so, so. Brioche is a nice touch as well. A little sweet, but I'm not gonna complain about that either. Mmm. Uh, let's get into a Syracrit dog, eh? Mmm. Oh, I'm a sauerkraut kind of guy. Mmm. It is nice. It adds a bit of, bit of something else, you know? It's a nice touch. A little, little something extra on there. Jazz it up. Splice it up. Very nice. Pretty good. I am super impressed with how this sausage turned out. A few little fiddly bits, but... Really, nothing too complicated in this. Real simple seasoning, bit of salt, egg, fish, fat, can't complain. So if you want to find out the recipe I used for this, head on over to my Instagram. There'll be a post on there all about these dogs and all of the ingredients, the ratios, percentages, all that kind of stuff that I used. Jump on there, and if you have a crack, let me know how you get on. I'm really interested to see what everyone else reckons about these fish dogs.